name is Jen. I'm in my 40s and me and my friend run a business via Airbnb here in the UK. We own a few different properties across London and while my friend acts as the financial backing, I run the day-to-day -day business of dealing with repairs and quest queries, as well as inspecting the rentals both before the guests arrive and after they check out. As you can imagine, summertime is our busiest period of the year, with business picking up a lot around Christmas too. But then we always have this really quiet period around the autumn where we struggle to break even, and it really puts a dent in our annual profits. So imagine our joy when last year we got a three week long booking for one of our swankier properties in North London. It was a huge payday for us, even with the block discount that Airbnb mandates, and we tried to be as welcoming and accommodating as possible to increase the chance of repeat business. For those of you that have used Airbnb before, you'll know that the vast majority of rentals are completely non-contact, and that style of rental only increased over the course of the pandemic. That means that we didn't meet our renters even once and throughout the whole of their three-week stay, we didn't receive a single call from them. The only thing we knew is that one of the two guests was a girl named Alice. Alice paid the deposit, the rental fee, everything. So about halfway through the stay, I dropped Alice a text to ask if everything was going okay. The reply said nothing other than like, fine, thanks, so we assumed their stay was going wonderfully. I certainly wasn't complaining that they were low maintenance guests because as much as I don't mind helping out where and when I'm needed, there's nothing worse than a guest who keeps calling you up every five minutes, asking where things are, claiming that things are broken when they're not. When their three weeks were over, I made my way over to the flat to make sure everything was in order. I wasn't expecting anything to be rough, maybe a few towels left on the floor, maybe a full bin bag, the usual stuff that people leave behind when they're in a hurry to leave. We'd had someone really make a mess of one of the flats before after having an all-night party there, so I was always ready to be greeted by an absolute horror show. But nothing could have prepared me for what I found in that flat that day. I knew something was wrong almost immediately after trying to get into the flat, as there seemed to be something blocking the door from the other side. It took me a good few shoves to get in, then I saw that someone had piled some chairs up against the door as a means of slowing down entry, but not completely barring access. I also noticed how cold it was, which was the first hint that I got that someone had left one of the windows open something we specifically asked guests not to do since the area had something of a pigeon problem. I rather quickly deduced that whoever had tried to bar the door had done so then used a window to actually leave the flat. By why ever in God's name they'd want to do that was a complete mystery to me, at least for the next few minutes anyway. I walked into the living room to shut the window and I could tell that it was the living room because of the cold breeze coming from it and that's when I saw the mess they'd made. But unlike the mess the partiers leave behind, which tended to be loads of empty bottles and cans, cigarette butts, that sort of thing, the place looked like there had been some kind of fight. Loads of glasses and plates were smashed, the chairs were gone, the tables were overturned, it was a complete mess. The next place I checked was the bedroom, deciding to leave the bathroom till last because I was honestly dreading whatever had been left in there, and seeing the state the bedroom had been left in just made me dread it even more. There were all kinds of empty condom wrappers all over the bedroom, as well as all kinds of adult toys strewn around the room. The sheets had stains on them, and God knows what they'd come from, but the whole room just reeked of you know what. It was disgusting. Finally, I braced myself to check the bathroom to see what kind of mess had been left behind, expecting something god-awful that I'd probably have to spend the rest of the morning cleaning. But then, like I said, I could never have been ready for what was behind that door. I pushed open the bathroom door, took a peek inside, then immediately slammed it closed after seeing something lying in the bath. Something person-shaped. I say person-shaped because just from the split second I saw it, it didn't actually look like a person not a living one anyway. It was all lumpy and covered in gore, almost like it was just pieces of fresh meat butchered and piled on top of one another. 
I think I was just in denial about what I saw at first. I mean, I didn't want it to be what it was. So in those few moments, I tried to think of everything it could have been instead of what it actually was. I don't know what actually drove me to open the door again. I certainly didn't want to, if that makes any sense. I think I'd actually managed to convince myself that what I'd seen wasn't real, that I'd just assumed the worst after seeing the rest of the flat and that it just wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Only, it was as bad as I thought it was. If anything, it was worse. It was a body, and it was just lying there in the bath in probably the worst condition you can possibly imagine. Partly the reason why I didn't recognize it as one immediately is because the girl's face was so beaten up that she didn't even look human anymore. There wasn't a single patch of skin that didn't have blood drying on it, but it wasn't that brown looking blood that had clawed it. It actually still looked kind of fresh, like it had only been there for a few hours at the most. I immediately pulled my phone out, dialing 999 to tell them that I needed the police as quickly as they could get there. The girl, who I assume was the girl who'd rented from us, was just laying there, perfectly still, and I couldn't hear her breathing or anything, so I just assumed that she was dead. I even told the bloke on the other end of the line that I was almost certain she was dead, and that's when he asked me to check her pulse to make sure. I did as he asked, 100% certain that I wouldn't feel a thing because in my mind, no one on earth could survive the kind of violence that she'd been put through. I don't even think I was touching the right spot on her neck at first, because again, I couldn't feel a thing, and after racking my brain for a minute, trying to remember the girl's name, I think I just blanked because of the panic. I just said, Alice? And then, she opened her eyes. Having that happen, like she'd properly come back from the dead or something, was the single most terrifying moment of my life. It was absolutely horrendous. They were all bloodshot too, and one of them had absolutely no white in the eye whatsoever. It was just a bright red mess of broken blood vessels. Then, as soon as she laid eyes on me, she started screaming and lashing out, terrifying me so much as I just ran out of the flat and into the corridor outside while shouting that she's alive, she's alive, down the phone. I remember the guy on the other end of the phone telling me to go and unlock the front door to the flat building, since it was an old style place with a door you could leave on the latch. After that, I had to run back upstairs to make sure the girl didn't let herself out of the flat, as she had obviously just launched into fight or flight mode after waking up and thinking that she was still in danger. When I got upstairs, the girl was half naked, just slouched in the hallway outside the flat, and she was crying her eyes out. I told her to stay put, and that the ambulance was on the way, Then all she did was cry those choked sobs while her tears cleared the blood from her face. And that's another image I'll never get out of my head, how her tears actually seemed to clean the blood from the parts of her deformed face they'd touched. When the paramedics arrived, I found out that the only reason she hadn't actually run off after waking up screaming was because she literally couldn't. I don't know what kind of damage had been done to her legs, but the paramedics had to bring in a stretcher up to the hallway to actually get her down into the ambulance. After she was taken to the hospital, a second set of policemen, the first went with her to the hospital, asked me to stay out of the flat on behalf of a forensics team which were on their way down. Then they proceeded to ask me a load of questions regarding exactly what I'd seen and what I knew about the people renting. Obviously, I knew next to nothing other than her name and the amount of time that she'd been staying for, but I answered their questions as best they could. They also promised to keep me in the loop regarding certain details of the investigation so I could pass on the details to our insurance company for the eventual claim we were going to file with them. About a week or so later, I got a call from an officer, and while he didn't tell me exactly what had happened, he told me everything he was permitted to tell me. Basically, the two girls who rented the flat were call girls who'd come down from the north to use the place as a kind of base of operations for three weeks because they could basically charge more for their services in London than they could up north. At least, that was their logic. Apparently, their little idea had worked really well, 
and they'd had a profitable, relatively trouble-free few weeks. But then, on the night before they'd been due to check out, some local gangsters had gotten wind of their little operation and didn't take kindly to them operating in their area. Apparently, these girls were charging quite a bit of money, but it was still lower than the rate that these gangsters had agreed upon for all their girls. So, they hatched a little plan. They would raid the flat the girls were staying in, scare them enough that they'd leave the area, and take any money they'd made in the process. But the thing was, the girls didn't keep much money in the flat with them, and were taking the cash to a friend of theirs who just so happened to live in London too. That's how only one girl ended up getting left in the bath. She ended up being the only one they beat the crap out of and torturing as a means of scaring the other girl, who they forced out of the window before making her lead them to where they'd stashed all their money. And that was all I was told. And as much as the officer hinted that they got a few blokes in custody, he obviously couldn't tell me who they were or who they were affiliated with. And that's all the info I got too, as the police didn't get back in touch aside to tell us that we were free to use the apartment again, and I was more focused on the insurance claim than anything else after that. That was the single worst incident in the history of our little Airbnb business, and probably one of the worst things I'd ever come across in my entire life. Okay, so a few years back, me and my girlfriend decided to get out of the city for a few days by renting an Airbnb. We spent a while looking at a bunch of different places, then finally settled in this place on a farm about two hours drive outside of the city. It was this little guest house on a farm, just across from the main house where the owners must have lived. We talked a little via email after actually paying for the place. Just little things like if we wanted some wine or some coffee left for our arrival. They were really friendly like that. Then just a few days before we were due to drive out there, they suddenly stopped replying to our emails. It was a little worrying, but not hugely so. I mean, we paid our fees and stuff, so we were definitely entitled to rent the little guest house for the week that we paid for. Besides, we figured that they were just busy or something and would get back to us as soon as they could. They told us in one email that the keys to the place would be in a lockbox that was attached to the place's porch, and that they'd email us the code on either the day before we arrived or the day of our arrival for security reasons. But then, like I said, they seemed to just go totally dark just a few days before, and they ended up not emailing us any kind of code. We were kind of annoyed, as anyone might be, and as we'd already paid our money and all that. I know we probably should have just cancelled the trip and got a refund from Airbnb, but we really liked the idea of staying out on this farm place as it would make the perfect little break from our busy urban lives. So we decided to just roll the dice, drive out there, and get the code to the lockbox by knocking at the actual farmhouse instead of relying on email and stuff. The place was relatively easy to find and both the farmhouse and the little guest house looked awesome. There was just one problem. The door to the main house was wide open, and there was a trail of clothes and household items leading up to a spot that looked like a truck or car had once sat. As you can guess, we could instantly tell that something wasn't right, as it looked like whoever had lived there had left in a hurry for some reason. Just to be sure, we walked up to the door, knocked on it, even thought it was open and called out, Hello? And stuff like that. We didn't get any reply, so there was definitely no one home and we didn't actually have any of their numbers so there was no getting in touch with them to find out where they'd gone or when they'd be back. Not that we actually thought that they were coming back anytime soon, the trail of stuff gave us a pretty good idea that no one would want to be returning at all. And the only real questions we were faced with was, why the hell did the family leave in such a hurry and what exactly scared them so bad that they'd want to leave so fast. We didn't exactly stick around for very long. The bad vibes were seriously heavy in the air, and my girlfriend was begging me to get us out of there from almost the moment we got out of the car. But in the time we were there, we didn't see any blood or anything like that. No bullet holes either. Nothing to indicate what had happened to make people want to run away. We made sure to call the cops on the way back into the city just to let them know that something had happened 
if they didn't know already. Getting our money back from Airbnb was actually much easier than we figured too. I guess they couldn't get in touch with the family either, and since it was still the day that we were due to check in, the money was still in digital limbo or whatever system they used to get us the money pretty quickly. I always wondered about what happened to the family though. We didn't end up getting any real answers about it, other than the fact that we got our money back pretty quickly, which I'm guessing meant that they didn't contest the refund with Airbnb. We've rented Airbnb since then too, with none of that same creepiness being repeated. So while I definitely recommend using the company, I suppose you just don't know what you're walking into until you're actually there. A few back, me and my husband got an Airbnb in the city we live in as a little staycation. We have this small apartment, and we rented this big fancy one for a weekend while my husband's parents looked after our son, who was three years old at the time. We arrive at the place, as it's just as nice as all the pictures, but the only problem was that the TV room had this really overpowering smell to it. It wasn't even like it was a bad smell either. It smelled really strongly of cleaning products, which, like I said, wasn't the worst thing a place could smell of, but it was verging on overpowering. We didn't spend long in there on the first day, mainly because we were out for dinner and a movie before taking a bath together and going to bed. But then the next day, while hanging out in the lavish TV area, we really started to get irritated by the smell. We tried opening some windows, and that kind of helped, but it was almost winter time, so even with the heating cranked up, it ended up being uncomfortably cold in the one place we really wanted to hang out. We ended up basically sniff testing everything to find out exactly where the smell was coming from, and in the end, we both decided that it was coming from the carpet. Then, almost immediately, my husband tugs on the carpet to see if there were any stains underneath, anything that might indicate why someone had really gone ham with the cleaning products on it, but it won't budge. Turns out it had those double-sided sticky things on it to hold it down, so it took a little elbow grease but we eventually pulled the thing up and off the ground. Almost right away, we see what's underneath. The both of us are like, oh my god. Because there's still a huge dark brown stain on the wooden paneling. We both knew what it was right away, and we both demanded answers from both the owner and Airbnb. Airbnb were the most receptive, but they didn't know a thing about it. The owner, on the other hand, hung up and pretty much went AWOL on us as soon as they realized what the call was about. We had to Google the address along with keywords like murder and almost instantly, we start getting hits about how a guy killed his girlfriend in the exact same apartment, maybe only a few months previously. The owner must have bought the place up, hired someone to do a half-hearted cleaning job, then just put the place right up on Airbnb for someone to rent and that someone ended up being us. We just went right back home, canceling our little staycation, but not before getting a bunch of different pictures of the stain on the floor as well as forwarding Airbnb customer services the articles about the murder. They managed to refund our money, and they promised us that the owner would have their properties delisted because apparently you're supposed to tell the company about stuff like that before you put an advertisement for a place up. But then the next time we went looking for a staycation place, we saw the exact same listing up there, like Airbnb had just totally ignored us. We got in touch again to leave an actual complaint against the company, but that time, Airbnb said the stain had been completely cleaned and that they were personally satisfied that the quality met with their terms of service. I mean, I guess people have died in tons of apartments all over the city, and that it's just easier to tell which ones than others. But the fact that we knew something terrible had happened there didn't sit right with us at all. I'm not talking about spirits lingering or anything supernatural like that, it's just really disconcerting to know that something creepy happened in a place where people were trying to relax and have fun. A few years ago now, me and a friend of mine got Airbnb in Berlin for the weekend a converted attic with two beds and some basic accommodations. The first night at around 4am, I heard footsteps walking up the final staircase which led directly to the door of the attic. 
The next thing I know, I see the door slowly peeling open, as if someone was trying to sneak in, and I get this gut-punch feeling of terror, realizing we've forgotten to lock it. I just lay there with my eyes glued to the doorway as it continued to open, until I called out thinking it was a friend trying to mess with me. No response, but then the door stopped inching open for a second. I called out again and again, and got no response. But then the door swung wide open, slamming against the wall, and I saw a shadow outline of a person, distorted by the darkness and illuminated from the window behind it. I went full fight or flight mode and sprang up and out of bed grabbing a nearby lamp to use as a weapon. I swung it while moving around the figure, then after what felt like a few minutes but was probably only a few seconds, I found myself with a clear path to the doorway and the subsequent staircase. I then threw the lamp at the intruder, and I flew down all three flights of stairs with so much energy I was lucky not to fall and hurt myself. I shook awake my friend, told her that we were leaving right now, calling the cops and that she should join me. A few minutes later, my other friends arrived and told us that the place was all clear but we were idiots for leaving the door open and trashing the place. We did leave the door open but we didn't trash the place. That must have been the intruder. Never stayed in another dodgy place like that ever again and I wouldn't if you paid me. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Back in 2018, I ended up flying over to Greece for a week-long solo vacation. There were a few hotels I had my eye on while I was planning the trip, but then for the same price, I could get an entire apartment on Airbnb, and some of the stuff they had available for rent was absolutely amazing. For the price of an entire ensuite hotel room, I could get an apartment that looked something like a legitimate millionaire might choose to stay in during a visit to a French Riviera or something. Greece doesn't exactly have the strongest economy, so it kind of made sense that it would be going so cheap, but even so, compared to the other listings, there's no way to describe it other than suspiciously affordable. Like any other sane person would have done, I immediately went to check the reviews and even with all the five-star reviews and glowing praise of the apartment's owner, I still thought the whole thing was just way too good to be true. But then again, there were only two windows where the place wasn't booked, so not only did that show that the other people were genuinely interested in the place, but it also meant that it was a case of poop or get off the pot, so to speak. I could book the place, check it out, then if it turned out to be some well-distinguished nightmare, I could just maybe just find myself a hotel chain with a simpler but more reliable kind of room, and just use the place to rest my head after long days of exploring my ancestral home. The flight over to Greece was the first long flight I'd been on, and the whole process just completely exhausted me. It's weird that just sitting on a plane for almost 10 hours can do that to a person, but I guess it was mainly the stress that took it out of me. Worrying that I'd lost my passport or my e-ticket, constantly worrying that I'd left something crucial back in my apartment. All irrational first-time flyer stuff, I know, but after the relief of landing without a hitch and making it to the Airbnb okay, I felt like I could sleep for days. Even the elation of seeing the apartment didn't keep me up for long, and my god was I elated. It was everything I could have possibly hoped for. A magnificent mosaic of black and white tiles and wrought iron spiral staircases. Hell, they could have charged double the asking price and people still would have paid it to stay in a place like that. But then the question remained, why exactly were the owners charging such a low rate? I know, I know, it was a huge question, one that any right-minded person would have still been asking themselves, but I guess the place's beauty and my exhaustion made for this perfect cocktail to wipe my brain of thought and... I told myself that I could always properly survey the place the next morning after a good night's sleep. I remember waking up just before dawn to the sound of something scraping really close next to me. I mean, maybe scraping isn't the right word, but I ended up leaning over to the bedside table, switching on the light and seeing what was definitely a cockroach running for the darkness below the bed. 
I hate bugs, and cockroaches have to be the top of the list for me. And suddenly, I understood why the pricing of the Airbnb was so low. The entire building probably had an infestation that they just couldn't get rid of, and maybe they couldn't afford to have the place bug bomb, so they were hoping for a few quick bucks from Airbnb so they could afford it. That little theory of mine made much more sense when the owners refused me any kind of refund, giving me some bullcrap excuse of how Greece has lots of bugs in the summer. Other guests didn't have a problem with it. They knew what they were doing, acting as if though a roach infestation is just like having a few houseflies, and trying to get a refund became a whole other story, just not nearly as scary as the one I have to tell here. So, if it wasn't already clear, there was no way in hell that I was about to spend another night in a place that had roaches so close to the bed. And luckily, I hadn't actually unpacked by that point. So I was able to just grab my stuff, jump in the rental and drive down through town towards the harbor front where I knew that there were a bunch of hotels. Only as I'm driving, I can feel that there's something wrong with my left ear, kind of like it felt cold on the inside. I started thinking that maybe I had some kind of ear infection, that the exhaustion and the stress of flying had messed with my immune system. But then, I was driving, on my way to book a new hotel room, and start some epic email battle to get a refund, so it wasn't like I was in much of a position to do anything about it. But the thing was, it was still like 5 or 6 in the morning at that point, so it's not like any of the local clinics were open for me to get looked over. So... When the weird feeling in my ears started getting worse, I decided to pull over near the harbor front and stick a cotton swab in my ear to see if there was any blood or pus or whatever. And apologies to those who found that a little gross, but if you did, stop reading now, because things are about to get way, way worse. I pull over, fish around in my hand luggage for a little Tupperware box of bathroom-related stuff, pull out a cotton swab, then gently push one into my ear. But then when I did, I felt something actually move inside my ear. At the time, I couldn't tell if it was because I'd actually pushed a clump of earwax or something further up my ear canal. But then, when I pulled the cotton swab out again, I see these two real thin, dark brown things stuck to the tip. I remember looking at them and thinking, what the hell are those? Until suddenly... The thought hit me like an entire brick wall falling on me. I kind of wiggled my head again and felt that same weird movement to my left ear. And that's when I realized something that was like a worse nightmare come to life. There had been roaches near my bed when I woke up. Something was moving in my ear. The two little skinny things on the cotton swab were roach legs. And there was a freaking cockroach inside my ear canal. I was in complete denial for a minute or two, actually saying no, no, no out loud, trying to talk myself into being something else. But then, when I actually accepted what was happening, I started to hyperventilate. It took me a while to calm down, but when I did, the next move was to grab the pair of tweezers I had with me, carefully insert them into my ear, and try to get the roach out all on my own. I can barely even describe how horrifying it was trying to work the tweezers in, touching the roach, then feeling it trying to scuttle further into my ear canal. It was like it was trying to burrow into my brain. I know that's not exactly how ears or brains work and that they're not remotely connected in such a way, but in my groggy, terrified state, that's exactly what it felt like it was trying to do. The more I tried, the more it seemed to crawl away from the biting pincers of the tweezers and I realized that if I was actually going to get this roach out of my ear, I'd have to drive to an actual hospital. That's how I ended up driving over to the Patrasis University Hospital, and throughout the whole of that drive, I was acutely aware of the thing trying to burrow its way further into my ear canal. At this point, I feel like I should make it clear that while none of it was actually painful in any way, it was by far the worst kind of mental torture that I'd ever experienced in my whole life. Walking into the ER was the first piece of real luck I got, as because it was real early on a Monday morning, there was next to no one else waiting to be seen by the doctors. 
After some mother-daughter combo got themselves seen to, I was called up to the desk to tell them what the problem was. The first nurse I spoke to didn't speak English all that well, so I had to wait a few more minutes while she found someone that did. The next nurse spoke amazing English, but when I explained what the situation was, she had this look on her face that told me she just straight up didn't believe me. She asked me if I was in pain, and I said no, but that I felt like I was going to puke. She still seemed skeptical, but then she took me to see a doctor who looked in my ear with an otoscope, and although I don't speak Greek, the muted reaction the doctor had told me that there was definitely a cockroach in my ear. Using the nurse as a translator, the doctor told me that the most important thing was for me to keep calm. As they put some wristband thing on me, I was told that getting the roach out would be relatively easy and they could 100% get the thing out, but I had to try and keep calm. If I didn't keep calm, I wouldn't be able to keep still, and to get the roach out, they were going to need to use some pretty delicate instruments that might damage my ears if I didn't keep perfectly still. Hearing that was hardly relaxing, but the nurse advised me to control my breathing and focus on the fact that everything was going to be okay, and that actually really helped me regain my focus. After that, another nurse took my blood pressure, which turned out to be alarmingly high, but then I put all that down to the stress of the whole situation, and we all agreed that I didn't require any kind of medication for it. I had no idea exactly why they were doing all these tests on me, and I'm sure they had their reasons, but I was just desperate for them to get to the actual extraction already. Thankfully, that's the next thing they did, and the nurse explained all the stuff the doctor was saying, how they were going to use this stuff called lidocaine as a prep for getting the roach out. The lidocaine would act as a numbing agent, making it so the extraction didn't hurt while also killing the roach. The lidocaine did its job alright, but before it did, the roach went into overdrive trying to escape the fluid, and this is probably the worst it felt for me, and I'm so glad that it was over after that. But literally being able to feel the thing dying in my ear, like speeding up and speeding up and just suddenly slowing down as it died, I'm not sure there are even words in the English language to sum up how horrifying it all felt. After about two minutes of feeling the roach die, the doctor took these big curved tweezers then started removing the roach, but not in one go. He did it piece by piece. Once the whole thing was out of me, or at least as much as they could pull out, the nurse showed me what they'd removed on a napkin. I guess it would have been about an inch long when it was intact, which I know isn't all that big, but it was still a cockroach running around my ear canal, so I don't care how small it was. After that, my ear canal was given one final check over just to make sure that there was nothing left behind, and they basically told me that I was free to go with a prescription for oral antibiotics and a type that I would need to put directly into my ear. My whole left ear basically felt numb for the next 24 hours, but then as the week went on, it didn't really feel any better. I guess it was just the aftermath of having my ear invaded by both a cockroach and a pair of surgical tweezers. But then the half-dead scratch session in my ear just didn't stop, so when I got back to Baltimore, I went over to my doctor to get checked up again. So, about a week after I got back from Greece, I went for my appointment and told her about the whole cockroach trauma. But just to be safe, she asked a physician's assistant to flush my ear in the hopes that removing any wax buildup would help my hearing and get rid of the pressure. Then... Once my ear had been flushed, they each took a look inside. I can't even begin to explain how much my heart sank when I heard the physician assistant say she saw what she believed to be a spiky insect leg inside my ear canal. I felt sick. The whole ordeal wasn't even over, and all I wanted was for it to finally just be over. My doctor ended up flushing my ear again and pulling out six more pieces of the roach that the Greek doctors hadn't even seen. And this is almost two whole weeks after the whole incident first took place. I guess what I've been looking at wasn't the whole roach, and I just wanted it to be the whole roach out of pure wishful thinking. I just quietly cried while the whole thing was going on, and my doctor was amazing because she actually gave me a hug when the whole thing was done. She's been my family doctor for years, so we had quite a close relationship like that for those wondering why she was getting a little too personal. But she also comforted me because she told me that there might be more of the roach in my ear, 
and that she was going to make me an emergency ear, nose, and throat appointment for the next day. When the appointment was over, I went home and tried as best I could to relax before heading to the ENT clinic the next morning. When I got there, they sat me in this real comfortable examination chair, then the ear, nose, and throat doctor placed some sort of microscope next to my head. He didn't say much at all. The whole examination basically took place in silence, right up until he said the dreaded words of, there's something in there, all right. The next thing I know, he's using what looked like a large pair of scissors with a blunt end to fish around my ear canal for the rest of the roach. That time, no kind of numbing agent was used, so it was actually painful sometimes, and because of the piece of equipment he was using, I could hear the pieces of roach crunching as he gripped them and pulled them out. Even when he finished and had fleshed my ear out with water again, to the point that he was 99% sure that he had gotten everything out, I still didn't feel that much better. That surprised me because I figured that once it was all out I'd actually start feeling free of the whole thing, but I didn't. Instead, I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that the remnants of that roach existed in my ear for like two weeks, meaning there was still a chance that I was going to develop a nasty ear infection. I've only ever really gotten over the whole thing over the past year or so, but even so, I'm deathly afraid of any crawling insect that might find its way into my ear, especially cockroaches. I'm not nearly as bad as I used to be, but it's definitely still a thing for me. And honestly, I don't expect to be completely over it anytime soon. In June of 2018, Boston area anesthesiologist Jalisa Jackson and Chidozi Iwandu decided on a week's vacation in Southern California. 29-year-old Jalisa and 28-year-old Chidozi had met while studying at the prestigious Johns Hopkins University of Medicine down in Baltimore and were already an item by the time they moved up to Boston together. Their personal life was hallmarked by a deeply loving romantic relationship, but their professional lives were deeply stressful with each routinely working 14-hour shifts either five or six days a week, and even on their days off, they were sometimes called into work to conduct essential medical procedures. Each of them found this lifestyle to be utterly exhausting, so when it came time to pick a vacation spot, they chose a place as far away from Boston as they possibly could, Los Angeles. After traveling 3,000 miles across the country, they checked into a small oceanside guest house they'd rented via Airbnb. The place had some truly excellent reviews, and its owner was so popular with those that rented from him that the company had designated him a super host, meaning he provided almost flawless customer service while making himself easily available to those that stayed at the property. Waiting for them at the property was a chilled bottle of wine, along with a friendly welcome note from the owner who referred to themselves as JJ. He wished them a delightful stay, thanked them for their custom, then left his contact details just in case they needed anything. Then, feeling like they were in safe hands, Julissa and Chidozi packed away their things, then settled in for the night. They believed that they were in for a dream vacation, the perfect anecdote to their high-pressure, career-driven lives. Yet little did they know, their vacation would turn into a living nightmare. Around 5.30 the next morning, the couple woke up to the sound of a loud and violent banging sound coming from the front door. The commotion just about frightened the life out of them, but a brave Jalisa grabbed her phone, readied herself to call 911, then approached the front door to see what was going on. As she got closer, she heard a rough male voice barking, I know you're in there, Kevin. Jalisa appeared through the door's peephole spying an unhinged, enraged man on the other side, and after barking at him to get away from the property, she decided to call JJ to let him know what was going on. But then, just as the dial tone started, the sound of a phone ringing could be heard from the other side of the door. Jalisa then opened the door, looked the man dead in the face, and asked, JJ? Yet the man simply looked up at her with a startled look on his face, then ran off into the night. As you can imagine, Jalisa was horribly confused, as was Chidozi when the details of the incident were relayed to him. Then, demanding an answer, Jalisa began calling JJ incessantly until he finally answered his phone. 
JJ seemed completely unapologetic regarding the bizarre incident and told Jalisa, Yeah, that was me. Sorry about the confusion, but that's too short for me to give you an explanation. Have a nice time in LA. Jalisa tried to fish for more of an explanation, bemused and outraged that a so-called superhost, who had seemed so warm and friendly in their welcome note, had turned out to be anything but. Yet before she had a chance to ask him anything, JJ hung up on her. Maybe things are just different on the West Coast, Jalisa told Chidozi in an attempt to explain JJ's bizarre and alarming behavior, and both agreed that it certainly made for a memorable welcome to one of the United States' most famous cities. The couple then spent the day at a nearby beach, and by the time the sun began to set, that morning's incident was almost completely forgotten. When they were done at the beach, Jalisa and Chidozi made their way back to their Airbnb, with the remainder of their evening being pleasantly uneventful. They finished off the rest of their wine, ate some of the best tacos they'd ever eaten in their lives, then sank into bliss while enjoying a saccharine rom-com courtesy of Netflix. It was only after they'd retired to bed did the terror ramp up exponentially. Shortly after 2 o'clock in the morning, the couple was scared out of their skin when a hooded figure literally came crashing through the large window of their darkened bedroom. The violent intrusion sent shards of glass everywhere, and both halves of the couple let out screams of terror as the figure smashed their way into the bedroom. I had no idea what was happening, Chidozi recalled, but I reacted like we were under attack. In an instant, the 230-pound, six-foot Shadozi leapt on the man as he simply lay there motionless on the bedroom floor. He tore up his bare feet on the broken glass in the process, but the surging adrenaline meant he barely felt it. In that moment, all that mattered was securing and detaining the maniacal intruder so that they wouldn't be free to harass them again. As he shoved his knee into the intruder's back, Shadozi screamed at Jalisa to call 911. He later said that he'd feared that the man might be hiding a weapon, or that more intruders might be attempting to force their way into the residence. As Jalisa grabbed her phone and rushed to call 911, her boyfriend barked at her to hide under the table, just in case any other armed men were about to burst into the bedroom. As she did so, Jalisa made a mental note of the man's attire, the goal of which was to provide as accurate a description as possible to the emergency dispatcher. Yet when she tried to get a look at his face, and as the hood of his jacket began to work its way back from his face, she noticed something that instantly sent chills through her. JJ? She called out, recognizing their so-called super host as the man who had just smashed his way into their bedroom. Chidozi was so shocked by his girlfriend's cry that he took his knee off of JJ's back, turning him over to confirm that the person terrorizing them was actually their apparent benevolent landlord. At the moment he loosened his grip, JJ tore himself free, then bolted from the building as fast as his legs could carry him. Minutes later, Jalisa Jackson was telling the police that they had just been attacked by their own Airbnb host and that he had gone crazy and that they needed assistance as soon as possible. Then, while awaiting the arrival of armed officers, Jalisa and Chidozi armed themselves with the biggest kitchen knives, then hunkered down in preparation for another assault. Yet while they waited, they suddenly heard the sounds of a helicopter hovering overhead. Then moments later, the courtyard between the guest house and the main house was awash with flashing lights. Jalisa then noticed two police officers leading a handcuffed man back towards the property. It was JJ, and he was ranting and raving about cleaning fees. He had apparently told the police that he had ordered his tenants to move out after they failed to pay cleaning fees, but as commotion unfolded, an elderly woman emerged from the main house and asked what was going on. It turned out that the woman was the property's true owner, and that she had rented the guest house out to JJ on the condition that he wouldn't sublet it from anyone else. Jalisa and Chidozi told her that, as far as they knew, JJ rented the place out all the time and that it was in fact his primary source of income. They asked her how she hadn't noticed all the people coming and going with luggage, but the woman meekly replied that she thought that they were all just JJ's friends. Thankfully, after placing a few calls to Airbnb, 
The company refunded the couple the full $708 they had paid to rent the guest house, and also offered to relocate them to another property at no additional cost. However, due to the trauma they'd experienced, Jalisa and Chidozi had no desire to patronize Airbnb in the future, and checked into a local Hilton hotel, even though it cost them an additional $2,300 to do so. In the aftermath, they sought $5,000 worth of compensation from Airbnb, owing to the terror and trauma they'd experienced. But after a period of intense haggling with the company's grievance department, the best offer they could get was two and a half grand. Airbnb did offer to sweeten the deal by paying for five therapy sessions for each of the couple, which they argued would tip the total compensation amount to well over $5,000, but Julissa and Chidozi refused. If you think that seems extremely miserly of Airbnb, you'd be right, as according to Forbes magazine, the company is worth around $38 billion, with an annual revenue of just over $2 billion. Almost every single night, a jaw-dropping 2 million people stay in Airbnb properties in over 8,000 cities around the world. So surely, they have the revenue to properly compensate a couple who went through something so horrific and traumatic. And for a company whose entire business model is based on trust, and who proclaims your safety is our priority, the incident in LA shows a chilling failure of Airbnb's screening system. The company itself has claimed that no screening system is perfect. But while this remains the case, couples like Jalisa and Chidozi will continue to be at the mercy of crooks and villains who only wish to prey on their fellow man. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, always check your ears for roaches.